Friends, I am beyond honored to introduce you to today's guest. I'm sitting here with my new friend, Sharon McMahon from Sharon Says So on Instagram. I always have to say, you know, if we have like a handle, it's just, it's helpful to uh, like, oh yeah, oh, that's that's who we're talking about. Um, Sharon, thank you so much for coming on the show. Mm, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Um, for women who have not been following along with everything that you've been doing, uh, like I have, <laughs> tell us who you are, what you do, and I would love to hear a fun fact about you. Mm. Well, I am a longtime government and law teacher and have left the traditional classroom and now do most of my educating on social media and via my podcast, etc. cetera, uh, as you mentioned, as Sharon says so. But I approach talking about government, politics, current events from a very fact-based, nonpartisan perspective rather than telling people who to vote for. My goal is to help you have the tools that you need to make an informed decision for yourself because it is really difficult to have an educated opinion with no education on a topic. So that's part of part of my goal is helping you feel confident in your knowledge so that you can make educated decisions for yourselves, for yourself and for your family. So I uh, do that full time and have a great a great time doing it. Um, and then in terms of a fun fact, well, it's difficult to tell on the internet that I'm six feet tall. Like you probably can't tell that from me sitting here right now. So strange. I look you like a normal size human. Mm -hmm. But if you meet me in public, you will be like, you are a giant. That will be your impression. And you're not wrong. It is true. Um, so that's something that you can't tell about me from online. Right, like you can't, you can't just tell because this is this is the view that you have. You have the view of my head and shoulders, unless I'm purposely trying to show you. But even then, I'm not being I'm not com being compared to some like an advertised person. So this that fun fact, I you know what the reason that we do fun facts in the show, I I have a different reason every week. This the reason we do this is because it makes us love our guests so much more. Like mm. this is tall girls unite. So I'm I'm five nine and a half. So I nice. also, when people meet me in person, they go, wow, you're a lot taller than I thought you were. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. My very best friend is 6'1". Nice. And so it's, it. I, another one of my best friends is 5'10", I believe. Like I have yeah. tall women in you my do. You do. You do. That's unusual. Yes. Love, like 5'10 and a half, something like that. Yeah. So tall yeah. women unite. Love it. I'm so thrilled. I'm, mm -hmm. I love knowing that about you. Mm -hmm. Tall women always notice each other in public. This is yeah. something that if you're not tall, if you're not a tall woman, you wouldn't know. But here's the insider tea. Tall women always notice other tall women because it is, it's rare, way more rare to be tall than petite, right? For a mm -hmm. woman. Um, and it's almost like this, it's almost like this secret solidarity of like, I see you. Uh -huh. I, I acknowledge the struggles that you two have had in finding pants. Yeah, I you know, was like, just gonna say, because, what we're, because what we're looking at is we're like, hey, um, where did you get your pants? Where like, are the pants from? Uh -huh. I need to know. Yeah. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. that it's my husband is six five, and uh, one of the advantages to have to having two tall people uh, in a relationship is that you can always find each other in the store or in a crowd because you can both see above the crowd. Uh huh. Well, okay, and so that's that handy. Is that's one of the things, like my most striking memory of being the tall girl. So girls, oh, I mean, at least I did, grew, I grew way faster than anyone else in my class and especially mm -hmm. the boys. So I was like number one in line at picture day for ages. Totally. Yes. And I remember our, when we started having school dances at like in like sixth grade or so, I would be with my tiny little middle school friends and I could never hear what they were talking about because there's like loud music going on and they're all like huddled together, whispering in a corner and I'm a full head taller than them. So I'm mm. like crouching down, like trying to get mm -hmm. my ear in the circle to try to hear mm -hmm. like what's happening. Uh. It just... Mm -hmm. These are things you don't know if you were the small one. So. No, no. Most tall women have some kind of traumatic story to tell you about being tall. Some way that they felt excluded or some way that they felt othered, especially in middle school where you you desire so strongly to just blend in and be one of the crowd. And yeah. you're just unable to do that because you literally are a head taller than everybody. I grew from being 5'2 to 5'9 in one year 
when I was 12 years old. And so there's just no way to conceal that. No matter how much you slouch, no matter no matter how much you try to just like, oh, I'll sit, you guys stand, I'll just I'm gonna sit down. You know, like no matter how much you try to conceal it, you just can't. Um, most tall women have some kind of story where they're like, it was real rough for a few years. Mm-hmm. Oh man. I just, if you, if we have, I know we have women who are just totally nodding right now in the crowd. You guys, solidarity. We love you. Mm-hmm. We're with mm-hmm. you. Oh my gosh. Okay. So Sharon, I have a thousand questions for you today. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to start by just hearing, like, I know that this is a years long story, but I would love to hear how this happens. Like how you went from teaching in, in a school setting to being who you are now, which is like America's government teacher. Mm. How did that mm. happen? Yeah. You know what? It started with uh, just a, a decision, a decision to do something that, um, you know, I had not really even considered before. And this is, I think, so true of so many people who start things that um, and end up being of consequence is they just made the decision to try something. Uh, they made the decision to try, even if they felt ill-equipped, even if they felt like, well, other people are about to watch me fail. Um, you know how they say, you know, um, people are not so much afraid of other people or uh, they're not so much afraid of failure as they are other people watching them fail. It's the judgment that you fear more so than the like, oh, you know what? I didn't make that much money at my business. It's not that. It's the other people who you know are talking about you behind your back. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just, there's a million examples of this from history where people just made the decision to just try something, even if they didn't know that they were going to be successful. So during the 2020 election season, which was crazy no matter who you voted for, nobody is like, let's do that every time. Nobody. Not mm-hmm. not one person is like, let's keep keep going with that situation. It was crazy mm-hmm. no matter what. Um, I noticed a lot of uh, misinformation on the interwebs. And the misinformation was not based on opinions. It was not like, you have the wrong opinion. It was, that is just factually incorrect, okay? You cannot graduate from the Electoral College. It's not a university. It's not a place you can go. You can't go get your picture taken in front of it. That is just demonstrably false, okay? Um, And so I remember very vividly this one uh, dude who was... Uh, interacting with one of my Facebook friends, talking about how, talking about, you know, visiting the Electoral College or, you know, people attending the Electoral College. And and I, in that moment, was like, I'm going to lose it on this person. They are just so confidently wrong. You know, like the brads and chads of the internet that are just so confidently, they're so confident in what they're saying, but it's so incorrect. Uh, where it's like, please take all of the seats, okay? You have zero education on this topic, clearly, but you're acting like you do. Um, and if I feel like if women had, you know, one nineteenth of the audacity of Brad on Facebook, <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Like, think about what could be accomplished. Uh, just have one like, I can't apply for that job because I only have fifteen years of experience. You're yeah, like, right. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, Brad would have died. Yeah, have the audacity of Brad. Right, just just <laughs> Brad, just pick any Brad. Um, so instead of arguing with Brad, which is not his real name, but you know exactly the type of dude I'm talking about, um, which I knew would like occupy my whole day, because if I posted like, listen, Brad, the Electoral College is not a real place. You can't go there. It's it's a ceremony. It's a concept that's held in all fifty states. Usually at the state capitol, there's not one facility that you can go to. It is unlikely that he would have been like, "Oh, you know what? I was mistaken. Thanks for that. I'm my bad. I was incorrect. This girl over here was right." It is very unlikely that he would do that, and consequently, we would have to go back and forth a million times that day. And I, so I had a decision to make in that moment of I'm either going to argue with him or I could just make a little amusing, nonpartisan explainer video about how the electoral college works, which is what I decided to do. And my thinking was my friend who is friends with Brad can just post a link to this video 
instead of me getting involved in all of the incorrect conversations, I was trying to create a resource for other people to be like, actually, here's how it works. Um, And I thought that would have far more longevity than my little Facebook comments would. So that's the genesis is I started making fact-based nonpartisan explainer videos and I didn't even use like the candidates real names because as soon as you say a candidate's name, people are going to start their little spidey senses go up. Like, do they like that candidate or do they not? Are they secretly trying to make them look bad or not? Do you know what I'm saying? Like I just made up fake candidate names like this. Here's Mary. She's running for president. Just made up fake names um, and had a little props and started explaining government concepts to people. And uh, they were popular and they took off. And I started um, getting phone calls from news organizations saying, could you come on and explain what to expect uh, on during the presidential election? Again, without telling us which candidate should win. Just tell us how the system will work. And um, I remember on election day, I was on a like a big syndicated radio show. And the host asked me, you know, what time tonight do you think we'll know the results of the election? And I was like, mm, pump the brakes. It's going to be weeks. We will not know the answer. To, we will not know the outcome of this election for weeks. And he was like, excuse me? Weeks? Um, and I was correct. It was, it was multiple weeks, right? Like oh, three weeks. So um, people realize like, oh, she not only knows how to explain things in a easy to understand format, she's also, turns out she's right about, about the things that she's explaining. Now, I'm not pretending to be clairvoyant or that I can, I'm not capable of making mistakes, but it, it, you know, like I was able to establish my credibility, if that makes sense, uh, in, the, in the arena. So that's really the genesis is I just started making content that people were hungry for. Oh man, I love it so much. I'm I'm so grateful for that because this is hard. This whole mm. everything is hard. I mm. want to actually, you know, I was going to ask you this at the end, but I would love to, I'm going to like just totally throw out my rule book for a second here. I feel like everything is a mess right mm-hmm. now. Um. I wanted to see if you could kind of zoom out for us a little bit and help us see what's going on in our country in sort of a, in like in context. Mm. And really, I think Mm -hmm. my question is how like divided and skeptical and angry a lot of us feel. Has this happened before or are we like in unprecedented times? (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. how scared? How scared, how scared are we right now? Mm. Well, first of all, if you feel like, wow, things are really a mess, I feel fear for the future, um, you're not alone in feeling that way. That is a very common way to feel. I hear that from uh, thousands of people every month, right? Like, I, don't, I just feel like everything's going to hell in a handbasket. You know, like that is kind of a very common sentiment. The majority of Americans on both the right and the left feel like the country is headed in the wrong direction. When you do when you do polls, almost everyone feels like the country is headed in the wrong direction. Now, if you're on the left, you probably feel that the country is headed in the wrong direction for different reasons then people on the right feel the country's headed in the wrong direction. Um, but nevertheless, it's not an un, uh, an unfamiliar sentiment amongst most of Americans. So all that to say, you're not alone if that's how you feel. Um, but is this the worst it's ever been? This is, a, this is a very common question that people ask me. Is this the worst it has ever been? I'm like, I didn't uh, phrase it that way, but you knew that that's what I meant. Yeah. That's absolutely mm-hmm. what I meant. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, we have had a f- little bit of an unprecedented time in the recent past with COVID and with, you know, um, election issues. It has been unprecedented. That is definitely true. Um, so there's, you know, that joke of like, I would like 2024 to be precedented times and not unprecedented times. That is my, that is my New Year's resolution. 
unprecedented times. So yes, very normal, normal way to feel. But let me give you just like a little example here. Um, During the middle of the 19th century, before the Civil War, there was so much violence in the Congress of the United States. Guns were fired. People were beaten nearly to death on the floor of the House of Representatives. You can Google the caning of Charles Sumner if you don't believe me. He's beaten nearly to death to the point where he is out of Congress for years because he is so badly injured. He was beaten by another member of Congress. Okay, we're not talking about like some intruder breaks in. Another member of Congress comes up behind him and begins beating him with his, you know, like a cane. Then Congress begins to investigate the man who beat this other man. And they arrive at the conclusion, you know what? It's probably fine. They do not arrive at the conclusion of, let's get this guy out of here. He is dangerous. Okay, that's not the conclusion. Nevertheless, the man who actually beat Charles Sumner decides, "Mm, you know what, before you can punish me or before you can do anything to me, I'm just gonna quit, okay? I'm quitting. But then he immediately ran for re-election and got re-elected. Okay, so, and what were they fighting over? They were fighting over the right to enslave people. That is what they were fighting over. So let me ask you a question. Has anyone been beaten within an inch of their life over the right to own other human beings in the United States Capitol this week? Not that Not I know. to my knowledge. Yes. Not to my knowledge, <laughs> right? Um, so... Not to say, and that's not to say that like Congress is uh, gets an A plus grade. They do not. They do not get an A plus. They don't get a pass from me. They're dysfunctional. I have a lot of beef with Congress as an entire entity. So don't think that I'm like, oh my gosh, Congress is so great now. Uh, it's not. But um, we have made progress. It is no longer legal to enslave people. Right? Uh, we are no longer beating each other, firing guns. That is not even the only example of a time that people have gotten into very serious physical altercations inside of Congress. Like there were times where people, Congress used to be heated with like big fireplaces, right? Because there weren't there weren't furnaces um, in the early 19th century. Um, and they would like walk over to these giant fireplaces and pick up like a hot poker and begin to like hit each other with them. So this, this we use a lot, you know, obviously uh, Alexander Hamilton is shot by the vice president of the United States. Aaron Burr was the vice president. Um, imagine Mike Pence shooting uh, shooting somebody while he's vice president, shooting him dead. Uh, a political rival. That's what that's what Alexander Hamilton was to Burr. Uh, imagine Mike Pence shooting a political rival dead, or Kamala Harris shooting a political rival dead, and that that seems absurd, right? That seems like well. Okay, what we have now is arguing and a lack of uh, a lack of working on behalf of the American people. And in some cases, we have corruption. Um, but we we have made progress when it comes to some of these issues that I'm talking about now. So I could talk about this for like three hours, but these are just like a couple of little examples of how the United States has actually made a tremendous amount of of progress. Uh, During the 1918 um, worldwide flu pandemic, uh, 50 million people died. 50 million people. If you think COVID was bad, 50 million people died. And it was mostly young, healthy people who died of what used to be called the Spanish flu. Uh, because of the way it worked in your immune system. If you were young and healthy, your immune system was created a response that it couldn't couldn't create if you were like old and your immune system was kind of lower. So we've had pandemics before. It's not to say that we should get excited about them again. No. Uh, but 
And, and then during the worldwide flu pandemic, we had World War I. Uh, and, and again, I could talk about this for three hours. I'm just going to cut my own self off because this is obviously a topic that I, I get asked about a lot and I actually am very interested in. Um, but no, are we fighting a world war in the midst of a, a pandemic killing 50 million people uh, where... Uh, you know, the Jim Crow South is very active and people who are people of color are not allowed to participate or vote uh, or living in, required to live in segregated housing, not allowed to patronize the same businesses as whites. Like, it is not perfect and we have a long way to go. But this is absolutely not the worst it has ever been. Not by a long shot. I Something about that just like helps me breathe. I like I can't explain it more than that. It's my I've spent a lot of time talking to my dad about this. He's about to be 74. Um mm. but he like he was drafted for Vietnam. He I mean he's seen mm-hmm. a lot of things in his life yeah. and he also loves history. And so we talk about it a lot and I'm like dad are you sure this isn't you know when my my girls were when I was pregnant I was like dad this is a crazy world to bring kids into. And he goes, mm-hmm. you know what? I felt the same way and so did my parents. And this is what yes. we're facing. And I yes. just feel like having some context just helps me breathe a little bit. So mm. thank you for that. Mm-hmm. My grandma told me the same thing. Like my dad is a Vietnam vet. My dad uh, died of his combat related injuries. He was a combat injured veteran. And, you know, like, so I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, you know, the Vietnam era and what the long-term effects it's had on soldiers who went to Vietnam. But even yeah. my grandma, who was born in 1922, I remember, she's no longer alive, but I remember having conversations with her where she said, my entire life, everyone believed the world was about to end. Her entire life, people felt like, this is the worst it's ever been. Any moment now, the world is gonna end. Uh, even somebody born in 1922, it was her lived experience throughout her entire life that humans have felt this way. Most humans are not like, we're living in a great time. The human experience is that things are bad. And it's only when we look back at times where we're like, you know what, it wasn't so bad then. <laughs> The 60s seemed fun. Like bikinis, okay. Uh, Convertibles, yes. You know, like it's only looking back at those times that they seem really great. But in reality, people were very, uh, there were a lot of things wrong with the 60s for people who were living in that time. And so the same is true of today. People will be studying these unprecedented times in the future. They absolutely will. Um, But they will also look back on this time and be like, so you had the entirety of human knowledge at your fingertips, you know, via like a smartphone, a a handheld computer, the entirety of human knowledge, and you spent your time making mean comments to people on Instagram? That's what you did with your time. You know what I mean? So people of the future will look back on us and have things to say. Uh, And some of it will be good, some of it won't be. But this is a very, this has been the human experience throughout recorded time. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. (laughs) Here on the podcast, we talk about decisions and transitions, but really a lot about decisions, um, helping women figure out what they want for their lives and then what it looks like to get it. And I I mean, voting is an incredibly important decision that we all get to make. Would you say once a year? Like, I feel like there's a special, at least in Tennessee, we've had a lot of special elections. So I feel like we've gotten to vote kind of a lot lately. Yeah, it depends on your state. It, some states have, you know, more thing, more upheaval. Tennessee has a little bit of political upheaval right now, Stephanie, maybe you've noticed. Um, So maybe that's a little more often than average, but I would say every two years minimum. We vote at every two years minimum. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about some ways that we can figure out what we believe. Um, But first, talk to us about why it's important to vote because I know that you know this better than every anybody and I know you hear this all the time. There's a sense that we're just like a drop in a very big bucket and like there are things that, we, you know, we look around and we say, I really wish that was different but it feels like kind of nothing we do is actually going to make a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so I think voting can, I think, you know, that's one piece of why I think we have a hard time voting is because it's like, what does it even matter? And then the other piece is like, I don't know if I know enough to actually make an informed decision. I don't want to just like, you know, close my eyes and pick something random. Mm -hmm. Um, So I want to talk about that next. But first, like, (laughs) does our vote matter? Are we Mm. capable of making any sort of change in our country or are we just sort of stuck with what we have right now? Mm. Mm. Well, first of all, your vote absolutely matters. And your vote is your voice. And so would you ever say that your voice does not matter? No, we would all say that things that we, what we say and do does matter right? It does matter in our homes. It matters in our houses of worship. It matters in our relationships with our family. It matters in our relationships with our friends. It matters at our jobs. It can matter for some people in the broader world. Nobody would ever be like, you don't matter, right? That would not be a message that anybody listening to this would agree with. You don't matter. And so to say that your vote doesn't matter is like saying, your voice does not matter. Your voice does matter. And your vote is your voice to use in the way that you see fit. Mm -hmm. And some people who work in the political space don't like it when I say that because we have such a very deeply entrenched two-party system. uh, And they, they view that as an invitation to vote third party, which really mucks things up for one party or the other. Very often it pulls votes from one candidate or another candidate. And I'm not saying that's not true ever. I'm not saying that a third party candidate is the best way to go vote. I'm not saying you should vote third party or you should vote Republican or you should vote Democrat. What I am saying is that there is almost no other important decision that you would turn over to strangers. Would you say to a stranger, you go ahead and decide which house we should buy? I don't care. You go ahead and do that. Would you ever say to a stranger, you decide which doctor should do my child's surgery? You go ahead and decide uh, what it is that I should do as a career. Of course not. Only we know our needs, our wishes. We Only we know our values. And so to not vote is to leave an incredibly important decision in the hands of strangers who do not know you, who do not know what your needs are, and who may not share your values. So for that reason alone, voting is incredibly important, that we do not leave important decisions to strangers. We decide for ourselves. Uh, That's one reason that I think it's important to vote. Another reason is the generations of women who came before us, who gave everything for us to be able to roll on up into the precinct, be like, I'll take this one, you know, if it's a primary and you have to choose a party or to be able to just like mark something off and stick it in a machine and go back to your car and drive home. With a sticker. With a sticker, a yo vote, I voted sticker. Women literally went to prison. They were force-fed with machines in prison. Do not Google uh, women's suffrage force-feeding if you don't want to be absolutely horrified at what women were subjected to in an effort to gain the right to vote. And so to... For because us, they were, especially, they were um, like, refusing to eat, right? Because if... Yes. If someone, I'm trying to remember, I just learned about this. Because if someone, if one of them died, they knew that they would sort of be the f- a martyr for the, the cause. Po- mm-hmm. huh? Yes, they would be a martyr. And that would uh, garner a lot of sympathy for the suffrage movement. And so prison officials uh, did not want people to starve to death. They wanted the women to eat. And so there's one woman in particular you can look up. Her name is Alice Paul, who was one of the big uh, the big organizers of women's suffrage in the United States in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, she would starve herself in prison and they would literally strap you into a chair and shove a tube down your throat. Um, very, you know, like medical equipment, not good. 
Okay, they didn't have anti modern antibiotics and like you know normal things that you think of if somebody needs a feeding tube. It's not like a little tube in your nose. No, no, no. Like a large pipe that your mouth is forced to accommodate, and then they would literally just force food down it. It's very painful and unpleasant. Women have gone through uh, so much for us to have the right to roll into a precinct, vote and leave. And to me, it is, it's honoring their legacy uh, in, a, in a way that I just, like, I think they would be horrified to know that some women are just staying home uh, when, the, when they went through what they went through to gain those rights on our behalf so that we did not have to. They paid the price so that we can just show up and vote. So that's another reason is I think it's an important thing to also teach our children that their voice matters and that they do have the ability to influence uh, things in the future. So I understand the sentiment that like, oh my gosh, I'm one of 20 million people. What does my vote matter? But it matters uh, for, that's not, even, that's not even counting the elections that are very close. You know, like we could get into that. George W. Bush won for the presidency by fewer than 600 votes. Oh, fewer than six, fewer than like it's. I want to say it's like five hundred and thirty-seven votes that George W. Bush won the presidency. I with. did not remember that it was yes. that close. Oh, yes. So that's not even you know like that's not even counting like yeah it literally matters because some elections are that close. But ideologically, we don't let other people make important decisions on our behalf without our input. We we acknowledge and honor the sacrifice of the women who came before us. And we teach our children that their voice is important and that who they are and what they think and say matters. Uh, and for all of those reasons and more, I think it's important that women vote, even if they feel like, I don't like any of these candidates that much. Um, it's a common way to feel, but I don't think it absolves us of the responsibility. Okay, I'm trying not to cry. Um <laughs> So the the second piece of that is that we have this voice to use and we're not totally sure like how to use it. I think I honestly, no matter how much homework I've done, I usually feel like I haven't done enough. And I think for a lot of us, we like don't, we don't know necessarily where to start or how much we need to do. Like, do we need to read someone's whole autobiography in order to have met them in person, have gotten coffee in order to know that like they get our vote or is like the Cliff's Notes version enough? How, like, what does it look like to become an informed voter? How mm. much do we mm. need to know to be an informed mm. voter? Mm. That's a great question. And today's voters are more informed than any voter in history. Because again, we have the entirety of human knowledge at our fingertips. We can Google what does Bob, what does Bob Smith think about, you know, polka dot bikinis? You can literally just Google these things. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas the voters of 75 years ago, they just had to rely on what was being reported in the newspaper or what was on the nightly news or what their friends told them. Uh, their, their ability to ascertain information about a candidate is far less than ours is. So first of all, absolve yourself of the responsibility of thinking that like this, I will only vote for my very best friend in the world, <laughs> right? Like I, I know everything about them. I know every secret. Uh, we've known each other since we were seven and that's who I will vote for. Um, that's not a thing that has ever been. Uh, you. That's not a thing, okay? You don't need to be best friends with somebody to vote for them. And Additionally, I think it's important to think about uh, what matters when it comes to leaders. Um, policies are very rarely enacted by a single individual. They are almost always a group project. They're almost always a group project of your state legislature and the governor or the United States Congress and the president. Uh, the, the president or your governor or any single legislator's ability to like come in and make a bunch of policies alone is very, very small. So for me, when it comes to thinking about what makes somebody a good leader, I care a lot about the character qualities of leadership because policies will have to be compromised on. Uh, 
Now, that's not to say policies don't matter or that I'm going to vote for somebody who thinks that we should, that, that, you know, thinks that we should just declare civil war tomorrow or whatever. Like there are some things that are clearly like, I can't vote for that. And everybody has what those things are in their own mind. Um, But policies can and will change in part because of the group effort, the group project uh, notion of lawmaking. And also people's minds can change, right? You can think about, uh, we, we can all think of a belief that we used to hold that we no longer hold, right? Like we don't all think the same thing at 32 that we did at 21. Mm-hmm. But somebody's character is much more difficult to change. Doesn't mean that it can't change with effort. Um, but it is far more difficult to change who somebody is than it is to change a policy. And so for me, the character qualities of leadership are are very important. And again, everybody's voice vote is their own is their voice, and they should choose what is important to them. But that's that's one of the ways that I think about things. Which person has the character qualities of leadership who can actually work on be on my behalf? as opposed to who says all the things I want to hear. Because anybody can say what you want to hear in an effort to gain your vote, but if they actually are a slime ball behind the scenes, it it actually doesn't matter. I don't want to be led by somebody who um, is a silver-tongued snake. You know what I mean? Like, that's not that's not interesting to me. I'd rather somebody be a humble servant leader who acknowledges their mistakes and uh, says, this is a really, really tough issue that we're facing. And here, here's what I'm thinking. And I want to hear from you. Um, you tell me what's important to, to you. And, you know, email me back. Come to my town hall, whatever it is. That, to me, is more important than somebody who's like, and everyone, when I take office, everyone's going to get a million dollars. Like, we all know that's not true. Don't make me fake promises that you don't have the ability to deliver on. And I want to know more about who you are, uh, what your character, your leadership character qualities are. Where do we, like, so you talked in the beginning about misinformation and uh, we have access to so much information. Not all of it's good. Mm -hmm. And so, like, part of me is wondering, okay, how do we find out about the character quality of someone without, like, I I think that we have an inherent distrust of politicians. And so it's like, even if I were to meet you for coffee, I still feel like you'd be, like, weaseling me a little bit, you know? How do I actually figure out about your, your character? But that really brings up the larger question of, where can we go for information that's true and real and not an infomercial trying to convince us of something? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a great question that a lot of people ask. And how do you ascertain anybody's character, really? I mean, how do you ascertain my character to invite me on this show? Right, you you at some level decided uh, that th- that I'm somebody who's worth talking to, and that I've done some interesting things, or I might have some interesting things to say. Um, what we do is our best, right? Like you you do your best to do your due gil- due diligence, just like I'm sure you did your best to do your due diligence before inviting me on this show, right? Like you would Google me, you'd be like, is she actually actually a convicted felon? Yeah. Um, I decided to overlook your criminal record. Yeah. (laughs) She actually just recently got a prison. No. Uh, You know what I mean? Um, you, You do your level best. And that is what is expected of you. Not perfection. Not, I have, I'm the FBI and have conducted deep, deep criminal background checks and I talked to your seventh grade teacher. Uh, Nobody expects that. What we can do is our best. And often, here's the thing people will tell you who they really are, right? They, they will give themselves away. They will. They always do. They always give themselves away. And sometimes we find out too late, you know, like we've already voted for that person. But when people tell you who they really are, you believe them. When you find out that somebody actually uh, did X, Y, or Z uh, thing in their past, unless they come forward and they're like, I made this mistake when I was young, and here's how I learned from it, and here's how I grew from it, that's a very different character quality than somebody who's like, I've never met this person in my life, when in reality, there's a ton of evidence that they have. Like, there's pictures of them together. You know what I mean? Um, It's different to admit your mistakes 
and to talk about how you've learned from them. Nobody has, nobody's lived a perfect life. Yeah. Versus um, somebody who narcissistically claims they never make mistakes, which is frankly too many politicians um, because mistakes are viewed as weakness and they feel that they'll be penalized for having made a mistake in the past. But studies show that we actually like people more who make mistakes and admit them hmm. than, than people who pretend to be perfect. Uh, we would rather be friends with somebody. We would rather vote for somebody. We'd rather patronize a business. That, In, in fact, this is an interesting thing about businesses. Uh, patrons, customers, will rate a business more highly that makes a mistake and corrects it effectively than if they never made a mistake to begin with. So character qualities are not an absence of mistakes. It's a it's an orientation of your humility to admit your past mistakes and to cast a vision for the future that other people want to follow versus a perspective of like, I alone can save us. That has never turned out to be correct. Not one time in the history of ever <laughs> has that ever turned out to be correct. Uh Progress is a sustained and concerted effort on behalf uh, that we all have to undertake. Uh, and the, our leaders should cast a vision for the future that we want to follow and participate in as opposed to casting themselves as the hero of the story um, and making it seem as though they alone can fix it. Yeah, that makes sense. How do we evaluate media and and really the things that come across our phones? How do we... What do we need to be looking for like before we trust something? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's always healthy to be skeptical. Uh, and there, there is not, um, there's never going to be a perfect news agency or a perfect, you know, these are run by humans, right? And humans make mistakes. So there's never going to be a scenario where like an infallible news agency appears out of, out of the ether. Um, but I do really appreciate the work of independent rating or ratings organizations like Adfontes Media. It's okay. A-D-F-O-N-T-E-S. You can follow them on Instagram or go to their website. Ad Fontes is Latin for to the source. And what they do is they have a team of evaluators who are, are left on the political spectrum, right on the political spectrum, and center. So they have a team of people from all of the ideological perspectives who then... Uh, work as a team. It's never just like right-leaning people evaluate a news agency or left-leaning. They they get uh, a minimum of three people from a variety of political ideologies to evaluate news agencies for two things. One is bias and the other is reliability. So right. you can be um, tremendously biased, but also reliable. Mm -hmm. And people sometimes think that bias is synonymous with lie that if you're biased, you're a liar, and that's not true. A bias is uh, how you might interpret facts. You would interpret them in a specific with a specific lens, but you might actually be able to uh, report on the facts correctly, right? Like the fire burned down two apartment buildings and three people died and 12, 12 fire trucks were on the scene. Um, you know, like, are you reporting those facts correctly? The bias might be, and the fire department did a terrible job for the following reasons. They had a personal vendetta against the owner of the apartment building. You know, like that would be indicative of a bias if there is an evidence to support those things. So bias and lie do not mean the same thing. That's the first thing that people need to know. Additionally, reliability is, you know, they, they also evaluate reliability. Somebody might have a bias that aligns with your preferred viewpoint. If you're right-leaning, you might really love listening to right-leaning media. You might really love watching Newsmax or Fox because they uh, have a perspective that you enjoy. Or vice versa, if you're left-leaning, you might really love MSNBC. You align with their perspectives. Um, but if a news agency is not reporting facts reliably, then that is that is problematic. That's how we get really, really deeply into uh, uh, misinformation spreading like wildfire. Yeah, it's one thing to um, it's one thing to read an opinion piece and agree with it, but if if a news organization cannot report the facts reliably, then that's that's a that's 
That's a big problem. So anyway, I love organizations like Advantes who go th- they they evaluate hundreds of podcasts and websites and you know all kinds of things and they put them on this chart uh, that allows you to see how biased they are to the left or to the right and how reliable they are uh, from like high reliability down here to like actually just make stuff up. (laughs) (laughs) Actually is just making stuff up. So I really like that. And um, that's a tremendously helpful and time-saving tool. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's really helpful. Last thing I want to touch on, and then I'm about to beg you to come back on the show. So just <laughs> like mentally prep yourself. Um, we, this is a big year. A lot is happening. And I want to hear any suggestions you have or, t- or tips you have for preserving our mental health this year. And then also preserving our relationships like it's, I mean, we're we're not about to go into the holidays, but we're going to hit the holidays like kind of, it's all going to explode at, at, at the Thanksgiving table basically. And I just, how do we keep ourselves s- sane through all of this? And then how do we hit, work with the people in our lives who, who might be voting differently from us without mm. like ending our relationship with them? Mm. Mm. It's a great question. And it's a, it's a very, very real concern of so many people. I talk to uh, so many people who feel like their their close familial relationships have been damaged by politics in recent years, uh, that they don't feel comfortable going to Thanksgiving because Uncle, Uncle Larry is going to be unhinged. You know what yeah. I mean? Like we, there's a good chance you have somebody in your life that fits that criteria of like, I don't know if I want to spend time with him anymore. Yeah. Um, so you're not alone if you feel that way. It's actually a very common way to feel right now. In terms of preserving your own mental health, the top tip that I can give you is stop watching the news. And I don't mean don't pay attention to the news. I don't mean don't be informed, but stop consuming it on television. Stop consuming it on television. Don't have it on in the background. Don't be one of those people who's like, XYZ News Channel is on 24-7 in my living room because I love the noise. Those people, though, we all know somebody like that, right? Like we all know somebody who has a certain news channel, whatever it is, on like 24-7. And mm-hmm. those people are always the most miserable people, are they not? Those people are not the people who are out there like feeding the homeless and rescuing kittens. And like they are the most miserable people, the people who who watch the most news. Right. Am I right? Do you need I, to have I've, something on, have like HGTV on or something like that? <laughs> yeah. Reading watch, <laughs> yeah, watch TLC. You know what I mean? Like there's, there. watch a cooking show. Learn how to bake a pie. Uh, listen to a <laughs> podcast if you need something to listen to. Uh, listen to a book on tape. So that's the first thing. Stop watching the news. Because of the 24-hour news cycle, new all news channels, aside from like the networks that have one 30-minute news broadcast at the end of the day, you know what I mean? Like ABC News has one 30-minute broadcast, but CNN, NBC, or I'm sorry, CNN, Fox, et cetera, they have these 24-hour news cycles to, to fill. And so consequently, they have to fill them with a ton of analysis. There are only so many hard news stories to report. This thing blew up. Here's how many people died. There's only so many of those stories to report. And then in an effort to fill the time, they need to bring on 32 guests who talk about how it is a certain politician's fault that that thing blew up. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it, that is what they're spending all their time doing. Next, we have Joanne, who is here to tell us why Bob the politician is actually Satan incarnate. Mm-hmm. Like that is 20 hours of their programming, and then a, like the other three and a half hours are commercials, <laughs> and then it's actually like 30 minutes of news. Mm-hmm. So stop watching the news and start reading the news. Start reading the news and um, read it from a source that you find is one that helps you further your understanding versus inflame or enrage you. 
Mm. So um, I think it's really useful to get one of those like little news aggregation things emailed to you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, from let, let's say AP, the AP News, Associated Press, they're highly rated for reliability and highly rated for being a center bias. They do not send you emails that are like, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. Um, they're just going to send you the top stories. And if a top story is like, oh gosh, I hadn't heard about that. Now you can click on it. And you can Mm -hmm. read more fact-based information about it. So you don't need to be uninformed, but neither do you need to subject yourself to hours and hours and hours of inflammatory political rhetoric on a daily basis. So that's my top tip for maintaining your mental health. Stop watching the news. In terms of how to preserve your familial relationships... There are a variety of ways that you can achieve this, depending on the severity of the problem. (laughs) Um, (laughs) For some people, it's easy to just be like, oh my gosh, I love your pie. Your pie is so yummy. What are you doing for vacation this year? Like for some people, it's really easy to just steer the conversation in another direction. Um, And you can even think about it ahead of time of like, what are going to be my topics that I steer the conversation towards. If you are somebody who tends to freeze in the moment, think about it in advance. Vacations, recipes, what are your kids up to? Do you have any weddings coming up? You know, like there's a variety of things that you can connect with your beloved family on that are not about how terrible or wonderful a certain politician is. Yeah. Aside from the fact that sometimes it's easy to change the subject, sometimes it's not easy to change the subject. And sometimes those things can get us worked into a state where we don't even want to see the people that we legitimately love and care about because it impacts us emotionally so much. And for people like that, I think it's really worth uh, setting a boundary with. And one thing that people often forget about boundaries is a boundary is not you telling somebody else what to do. A boundary is telling somebody else what you will do if the boundary is violated, right? So Mm -hmm. they could look like this. Text to your whole family. I'm so excited for Thanksgiving. Um, I look forward to this day every year. I cannot wait to have a piece of apple pie with each one of you and to hug you, to see your faces and hug your necks. And I cannot wait. I want to let you know that I am opting out of conversations about politics this year. Um, And so if you guys want to talk about it, feel free, but I will not be participating in those conversations. Um, That's telling them what you will do. It's not telling them what they have to do. People really don't like to be told what to do. Like that's just human nature. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to move away from thinking of boundaries as bossing other people around. And, And a boundary is set for your own self. It's not set on behalf of someone else. And then if somebody brings up politics, you don't feel like you have to respond if that's not something you want to do. I'm not saying nobody should talk about politics, but if it's something that you feel like, I cannot talk to him. Um, I just cannot. It's too much. It's too, he's too, it's just like too upsetting to me. Then just tell them. I'm. But tell them before you get there so that it doesn't turn into a same day conflict. And if it does come up, then you don't feel obligated to participate because you already told them you're not gonna. And you can just get up and clear the table and you can start cutting up the pie and asking people who wants ice cream. Mm -hmm. And you can start washing the dishes or you can turn on the game or talk about when you're going to put your Christmas tree up. You know, like you don't, you then absolve yourself of feeling like I need to engage in this right now. Yeah but it allows you to keep those people in your life because Mm -hmm. certainly there are some relationships that are not healthy for us to be in. They're abusive and I'm not encouraging people to stay in abusive relationships. But how do we ever expect anyone's mind to change if we don't stay in their life? Mm -hmm. How do we expect to influence them for good if we have cut them off? If we ever want that person to be less off the deep end, how will that ever happen if we never see them again? So 
there is something to be said for preserving a relationship on whatever level is emotionally healthy for you so that you are there if that person ever decides to have a change of heart. I love this so much. Sharon, I seriously wish we could talk for 17 years. Um, <laughs> I, but I'm so grateful for your work and for how, for your time. And um, we're going to be linking to all of your everything in our show notes so that everyone can follow along with you and learn from you. And thank you for being just a source of peace and guidance in a year when mm. we really need it. Mm. It's my pleasure. Thanks for being here. And thanks for the work that you do. And thanks so much for inviting me. 